We are back for the start of Q3 2024. Going to be an interesting week in the markets. We got jobs data later on. We'll be discussing all of that, everything going on to start the week, and much more today on Money Never Sleeps. Thanks for joining us today, everybody. As we get going, do us a favor. Like, if you hadn't, you know, hit that little that little like button down there. See that, that thumbs up? See that thumbs up? Just go ahead and click it. And then subscribe to our channel as well if you haven't. And remember, nothing Kevin or I say is financial advice. So please do your own research. Kev, I had a great weekend with the family. We are back. First day of Q3. We have all sorts of interesting things to discuss today in the u.s abroad we haven't done a show since the biden trump debate if you can even call it that well, how are you doing today buddy i know we're both looking at some sports stuff right now you're on the nhl side i'm on the nba side infuriated with our teams so you know a lot going on on this beautiful first of july absolutely i'm bearish on vegas and I'm bullish on nashville at this point but uh yeah it's um you know i'm doing pretty good long weekend so a little bit tired but i expected it kind of to be a slow week to start this week right we're in the summer months end of quarter uh it's starting the new one i mean yeah starting a new one we're in what is this q this q3 now day day one of q3 my man wow amazing flying through this year that means chaos is upon us i'm just kidding i don't know if that's for sure or not but I, i will say that we have a few earnings this week too so there's no reason for anyone to be really in this market. So what we're seeing, I think, more than anything right now are retail investors that are just buying a little bit of stock, you know, playing around. Uh, I think a lot of the institutions are kind of putting the brakes right now until at least the holiday. But we do have some major data that comes out Friday, which could implicate some problems in the futures markets and also cause some volatility maybe at the end of the week. But I think right now is going to be kind of just a relax, maybe retail buying in, talking about, oh, yeah, I bought NVIDIA at, I don't even know what it is right now, 124 at the barbecue, and then you should buy some more. And then, you know, then all I'm going to say is if you aren't (laughs) using the 4th of July holiday to pump your crypto holdings, uh, yeah. and your meme coin bags, then you aren't really as dedicated to the cause as I thought you were. Let's look at the week ahead in the markets before we go back a little bit. So some manufacturing data came out today, softer than expected. Construction spending came in under expectation. The manufacturing gauges, S&P and ISM came in lower than what was forecast and what was in previous months. So continue to see a bit of softening there. Tomorrow we get uh, Jay Powell is going to be speaking in Portugal. Uh, so he's off, you know, globe trotting, enjoying his life. Good for him, I suppose. We'll also get the job openings data, the JOLTS report tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern. Previously showed 8.1 million job openings. Median forecast this time is 7.9. So maybe the labor market is starting to get a little bit worse. Then on Wednesday, we'll have more jobs data. We'll have uh, some, you know, services data. We'll get Fed minutes from the last FOMC meeting. Obviously, Thursday is the 4th of July holiday here in the States, so markets are going to be closed. No data that day. Friday, bright and early, we get that big jobs report, another piece of data leading into the next FOMC meeting. So that is what we are looking at in the days ahead. Kevin, let's talk about Thursday's debate Debate between yeah. Trump and Biden. Uh, I watched approximately 10 seconds of it because I just can't. I can't listen to those dinosaurs talk about uh, anything, really. So I'm curious if you had a chance to watch it, how the markets reacted, how the markets are now, you know, there are betting markets around who's going to be the nominee, who's going to be the president. Biden tanked hard in those markets. You know, we're seeing a rising possibility of him not being the Democratic nominee come November. We're seeing Trump moved past a 60% probability of winning the election in November. So what did you see in the debate? How are you seeing it impacting the markets? Yeah, I I didn't watch the debate because I was working, but I was able to catch some of the recaps in between the highlights. 
man uh you can't call them highlights it was <laughs> low lights i, I, I guess that probably it. I think there are a lot of people were high on that stage that night because that was just absolutely insane to see how performances were like, obviously everyone was talking about Trump line. People were saying that Biden was just like, didn't know what the hell he was saying. And, you know, I'm not going to get into the politics of it, but it just kind of showed you that there is more, I think in the aftermath, more instability in the U S government that could definitely implicate problems for the U S economy. Two two ways. Obviously, one, if Trump ends up becoming, you know, the president again, uh, the markets are going to react a very different way than if Biden were to win. And I think if Biden were to win, you would start to see markets even react more negatively just because you kind of see that people are recognizing some type of cognitive decline in uh, in his performance. I know they're saying that there is that was just a blip performance, but we won't know about that again until September. Right. Um and I mean, we kind of have the idea. It's like everyone's saying that he needs to step down now, but you also have to question, okay, well, you know, step down from the race now, but it's like, what about now as we're kind of got what six, five, six months left of his uh, term. It's like, are we just going to kind of let this happen throughout the rest? If we're having problems with him running again, wouldn't we have issues with him now, right now running the country? So it really begs the question of him not stepping down as well. What type of instability is this going to cause come, you know, the convention? I know the Democrats want kind of like an open convention to the point where it's like maybe a different nominee could come up. I don't necessarily know if he's going to be easily to step down at that point. So there's definitely a lot of turmoil that we're seeing. And this instability definitely does affect markets. And the problem is we're in a bull market, if we want to say so, much, like by percentage points. But the question is, could something absolutely catastrophic happen to the point where it's like people lose faith in the market or in the economy and you just start to see the market pull back because it's so frothy and so overbought. I think this debate kind of showed you that come the next few months, there's going to be a lot of volatility. And even that it happened so early and we've been talking about that VIX chart, it kind of lines up with right around the convention that August, September, October, there's going to be a major VIX spike. So anything could really happen at this point. I was just taken back by the fact that the performance was just bad on both parts. Obviously, Trump, I think, showed that he has more cognitive ability, uh, you know, to the speak. Fact that, that is what we're like hanging our hats on for the two likely uh, presidential candidates is just a very sad state of affairs. And, oh, God, it makes me want to throw up a little bit like that's this is the best. And the other guy <laughs> and the other guy's got an earworm, right? Or a brainworm or something. But uh, it was funny. I was actually watching Kennedy's uh, some because uh, Kennedy was <laughs> those guys on the TV screen. And then he was answering the questions because they wouldn't let him on the stage. So he was just doing this like on his own, like simulcast. This is fucking hilarious. But um, yeah, I think it's going to be I, like I said, I don't know who's going to be president. I um, at this point, I don't think whoever is president is going to be able to save the economy. I think whoever is ends up being president is going to inherit arguably one of the worst crashes in uh, U.S. history and when it comes to, you know, financial markets. And it's not something that we could put the blame on just one person because I think it is a global problem. And we're going to see, you know, how bad it really is. But, you know, we may, might not know until next year. It's very possible. So I think markets are definitely going to be impacted, but I, I wouldn't be sure. I think it's going to get worse if Biden were to be nominated to win again just because, I don't you know, think there's people a are gonna, to hell he's going to win again. Like, well, I don't even think he's going to be the nominee, to be honest with you. Yeah. Like, <laughs> be honest, with, but it's something, anything could happen at this point. I, I have no knowledge of what will, where we'll be in six months. I've seen the headlines that, you know, a lot of different people involved in crypto are bullish if Trump wins. People are making the assumption that he's going to like stick to his word when it comes to like being exactly. a pro crypto president. And uh, this is not a, you know, can we trust that? I don't trust that personally. Like, I don't trust the guy. Um, I'm not. I'm not a Biden. Trust fan no one. Imagination. I'm not a fan of you. Like, I'm annoyed that these are the the two leading candidates, and we can't have someone better up there. But I don't trust either of them to do uh, what they say or what is right. So, I guess we'll just have to just hope for the best and prepare for the worst. What else? Let's talk internationally now. I know you've been keeping an eye on some of the global markets. Yeah. More political uncertainty over in France, and that is impacting them. Where, you know, I don't know the latest in Asia. I'm sure you can give me your Japan report. Where do you want to take this from here? Let's talk about France real quick, just because I think this is another really big event that's coming up in the world right now. And we're starting to see some big protests that are happening in France. And we're starting to see Marie Le Pen in the first half of the, that election 
be up significantly uh, against Macron. And the reason why that's important is because she's obviously, you know, I'm making this sound like, oh, this person does this, this person does that. They're politicians at the end of the day. She says that she's anti-war and the war in Ukraine. So obviously that affects funding for that. But the problem I'm seeing is a lot of people in France are just absolutely upset. And we're starting to see, you know, a lot of protests and riots break out. That's very bad for the Euro. And it's also extremely bad for the Olympics that are coming up. That is the next major thing where the entire world is going to be watching and you have all these protests going on. I think it's going to be kind of a shit show. That's just one thing to bring up. But the market itself in France is bringing up the fact that, uh, you know, they're kind of pricing in the equities that if um, Marie Le Pen wins and the, the party wins, then you're going to see a more conservative government in France. And they're kind of bullish on that right now. So it's very interesting to see how the market's reacting there. I think that's also kind of lining up with a weaker euro, which is what we're kind of seeing as well. And I think the euro is going to continue to weaken, especially as, as long as the longer this war goes on, the more that, uh, you know, the ECB or the I guess the EU has to kind of foot the bill for a lot of this. You're going to continue to see problems with the euro. I think it's going to make the dollar a lot stronger as well. And on the flip side of that, when we go to Asia, we can see that the yen is just out of control. Um, it has not gotten any better in Japan since we've last spoken. Um, I think the best thing that's happening for these banks in this week are probably the holidays, just so they could have the doors shut and not have to worry about doing anything. Uh, I, I would assume a lot of people are working overtime behind the closed doors to make sure that these banks remain solvent. But the problem isn't just in Asia with these banks. It's also in the US, but I just want to pull up the yen real quick. Uh, no, that's not what I want. Why isn't this popping up? Here it is. Okay, my bad. Just pulling up the yen. It is 161.50 right now. Uh, a while ago, we can see that they did the intervention roughly a few days or a few weeks back right here around April 29th. Yep, and it got rejected and it went all the way down to about 151. Now the problem is it broke above the intervention level and they're not doing anything about it. And they said that, oh yeah, we're going to do something about uh, the currency 24 seven if it gets above a certain level. How hard, how far are they going to let this run away? And the problem is by doing this, you're causing greater inflation. They're going to cause, there is going to be a point where they're going to have to intervene or they're going to have to raise rates in order to combat this. And the bad thing is on the flip side, like we talked about, that's going to absolutely tank their equity markets. But the funny thing is as well, you know, I'm zooming here and this is on the Nikkei. Let's go to the daily. This massive pattern that I was showing you guys, it looks like it's about topped out in my opinion. I think that we're getting very close to the point where the Nikkei is going to top out and it's going to start to roll over into another five wave correct move to the downside. And if we're looking at this in terms of, you know, long term, let me remove this, remove this, get rid of that because that broke down from there. We could say that this is some, you know, one, two, probably a major three, four, five pattern. And we could have a bit of a bounce in, in say, the midterm and then have another five waves down. It's a massive ABC correction on a larger scale. But I do think that with the Nikkei, if the yen continues to be problematic and Japan decides that they're going to raise rates here, there is only one thing that's going to happen to these equity markets. You're going to see a huge outflow of capital from these into either bonds or you're going to see them flow into the U.S., into the U.S. dollars. It's very likely that we see that in timed with maybe some of the banking crisis that we're seeing in Japan right now. Uh, I still think that the derivatives market in Japan is about to go tits up and that's going to cause a lot of problems globally. You're going to start to see a lot of people pull money out of these banks, fire sales, not a good look. And I think that that could unwind very quickly. Again, the, the currency problems that we're seeing in the world right now are just so out of hand and there's a huge dollar shortage and we're also seeing collateral shortages across the board that's why we're starting to see some of these insolvencies rise and get closer and closer to the point where we could start to see banks fail at a global scale now to go over to the u.s something that we got last week we didn't talk about because it, it came out after we did our show was that the fed conducted their stress test and of the 31 banks that they did the stress test for all 31 passed. Something very similar that we got in 2023 before March and something very similar that we got in 2007 into 2008. Um, here's the thing. They only tested the banks with $100 billion worth of capital or more, or you know, obviously that they're, uh, they're managing. What about all the regional banks? Those are all banks that are under $100 billion. They didn't do a stress test for those. We can assume that those are probably still in the same boat with rates being still elevated, no sign of cutting in sight, that there's going to be problems for them in the mid to near future. That would be my assumption. Uh, but looking at this here as well, the U.S. banks, four of them 
uh, I believe, raised their, uh, what do you call it, dividends. Uh, so it was, or at least three, I think. It was either three or four. Bank of America, Citigroup, and Goldman Sachs. Chase, JP Morgan was $1.25, so up about 10 cents for their dividend per share. Uh, Bank of America is very small, 26 cents, up from 24 cents. And then Goldman, I can't, uh, what was it? Or Morgan Stanley is 92.5 cents, up from 85 cents. Why are they doing this? So maybe incentive for people to believe that things are okay. We don't necessarily know that. The thing that's really scary is why the Fed says that all 31 banks pass is because imagine if one of them didn't pass, right? then you would probably see people very scared and pull their money out and that would cause a bit of a run and that would kind of exacerbate the problem because then other people would start doing it from other institutions. Say it's a Goldman Sachs that's uh, on the brink of insolvency. I'm not saying that they are. Say just for example, well, do you think people that have their money in Morgan Stanley or uh, JP Morgan would also get scared, especially you know wealthy individuals? It's a good chance that they would. And that's how bank runs kind of play out. It's what happened in 1907. It's very similar to what we were seeing in 2008, right after Bear Stearns and uh, Lehman Brothers. And it's very possible we could see that similar to what we saw last year in March. And I remember last year in March, some of those banks were losing like 10% of the capital that they were holding per day in that week leading up to the to that uh, major intervention that the Fed had to do with the BTFP. But looking at this here, the Fed cannot say anything bad about anything about any of the banks or any of the situation because they would be responsible for causing it. If there's a problem and they say that there's a problem, then there's going to be a problem. That's the problem with saying anything right now, um, or even the truth, or even anything to the to the level that there is, you know, room to be concerned about any, the health of any of these institutions. They kind of are just hoping that by not saying anything, everything will be okay. No one will pull their money out. However, as we know with the monetary system, these problems do come back to haunt you. Insolvencies do, you know, come through, and if it's anything similar to 2008, you know, we saw banks like Washington Mutual, massive banks, just go under and get acquired. It's very possible that it happens here. The only difference is that those banks that went under the other last year, I think, were some of the largest banks, way greater than those that were the losses that were lost in 2008. All right, let's move on from there. Uh, I'll. I'll do a choose your own adventure. Do you want to go talk TradFi with things like Nike and Walgreens, or do you want to go to crypto next? Uh, let's finish with crypto. Let's just knock out TradFi real quick because there's not much that we can talk about in terms yeah. of this. So let me pull up Nike. And it's just funny to see the Nike and Walgreens things because Nike's obviously getting their ass kicked because the consumer is pretty much dead, right? That's what we saw last week. And you see this massive gap. I don't know if that's going to be filled, dude. Maybe not in this, maybe not in my lifetime. Um, especially if the consumer continues to be extremely weak, maybe Nike discounts, uh, discount or outlet stores are doing pretty well in the future. But this, I mean, that's a really big jump. I mean, it was down 20%, I believe at one point, um, to think that this is going to change anytime soon, who knows, but it shows you that some of these equities are definitely crashing faster than others. And if everything does start crashing at the same time, you could start to see a fire sale. I think these are just slips in the cracks or, you know, cracks in the system that are starting to show, we haven't just seen it from a greater you know vantage point so again nike does it make sense that they're dropping yeah i mean they do offer premium products for the most part i know the running shoes are stupid expensive now i know they do also have consumer level products that they're probably selling that are probably doing better but for the most part people probably just aren't buying nike sportswear uh because you know it's expensive and we know that there's not much capital out there i don't know if they still have a firm or klarna to be able to buy some of that stuff and just never pay it's them back you know the quality has gone to shit on nike products it is terrible. Uh, it's so bad like i have some nike shorts that i bought this year that are just like pretty terrible uh so that's just my that's what i wanted to contribute real quick to <laughs> yay is my personal bias uh, you know, I've been a, a Nike buyer for a long time and it's, it's starting to really piss me off. Yeah. I don't even run a Nike. I used to run a Nike in high school and they had like lunar glides and all it's, they had pretty, pretty nice shoes, but the foams are extremely cheap and they have just amped ramped up the prices on, on products. So it is what it is. Uh, they're shooting themselves in their own foot. Let's look at Walgreens real quick. We're real quick. Uh, Walgreens is really interesting because I can't even talk right now. Uh, here it is. Walgreens, but here's the here's the thing with Walgreens. It's been a downward slope for a long time. If we look at this on the monthly, I mean, when the fuck has Walgreens been doing good? I guess that's that's what we have to say. This is the monthly. This is at a point where, you know, could it go lower? Absolutely. But where how low could it go? Eight dollars, you know, five dollars thirty-seven cents, probably three dollars and forty-six cents. Looks like there's a lot of support down there, just 
over the period of time that it's been uh, operation, operating. Zero. zero is very possible too. And here's the problem. Look at the volume for how much it's coming down. I mean, that's just pure selling. People are just saying, fuck this. Let me get out of Walgreens stock. There is no bounce coming. At least that's what I would assume looking at the volume and how the price action is reacting to it. Um, but yeah, it's another consumer staple, right? It's where people go, I guess, for prescriptions, for photos, for any type of convenience. Just bleed money, though. That's that's the problem. It, you know, it costs money to have a store, to operate, to have employees, to keep the lights on 24-7, as some of them are. I'm, I'm not even sure if they do 24-7 Walgreens anymore. And maybe it's still so. just 3 a.m. or something like that. But uh, yeah, it, it's expensive to operate some of these, these stores, and it makes total sense that they just are bleeding money because, again... What does Walgreens have to offer to consumers right now? I don't know. Let's see when it did go up, though. It looks like its rally was into October 2015. Did it even get a COVID rally? Yeah, probably. kind of. <laughs> it went from $34 to $57. It was probably just buying face masks and gloves at that point. But uh, after that, bye-bye. So, yeah, those those stocks are just – seems like they're bleeding out. Um, just to look across Tradify real quick before we get into crypto – Obviously, still doing pretty good in the S&P if we look at this on the monthly, but extremely heavy volumes have been mid, you know, just staying level at this point for a few months. Uh, extremely overbought on the NASDAQ. Dow Jones, extremely overbought. Looks like it's starting to form that diamond pattern that we were worried about, which means that we probably see a bit of a pullback in the months to come. The other one that I do want to take a look at is NVIDIA. And the reason I want to look at NVIDIA is because on the daily, there's a bit of a chart that looks interesting to me. And I think we are getting it. So I'm I'm very interested to see how these next few weeks play out. But what I'm seeing here is let me see. I Ace, find happy Monday to you, our guy. Thanks for joining us. I mean, it's kind of hard to see, but it's a bit of a head and shoulders pattern right now. I'm seeing on NVIDIA. And the fact that Jensen Huang keeps selling and he's not stopped selling. He's just like, instead of, he's doing the opposite of Jim Cramer. He, he's there, buy, 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 buy. He's doing sell, 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 nonstop. I mean, it's up to $130 million, I think, of stock in the past week. It's so funny. 150. It's so funny that uh, <laughs> like, we don't sell NVIDIA here. We hold it. And Jensen's like, I'll sell that shit and just get in that bag. Good for him. Get your money, Jensen. Yeah. He, Jensen said, fuck you, Muppet, and sold $150 million worth of stock. And then Jim Cramer is like, NVIDIA, hold it. Don't trade it. Fucking, oh, my gosh. I can't wait to say, see the meltdown. There was a great video of the, of the financial crisis in 2008 where Jim Cramer is like, and they just keep pounding it. And there's, you can't see where the buyers are. And they just keep selling. This is horrible. You just, you just have to buy it and not look. It's like, no, Jim, Jim, relax. Don't buy anything right now. This is the, this oh. is the worst time of the world to buy something in the middle of a, a falling knife. Uh, but, yeah, so NVIDIA, head and shoulders pattern. We're going to keep an eye on that because that might be something that could break through and if that's the case i think we're probably going to test a 50 moving average and there's a good chance we might not hold it uh supports would probably be between 107 and 906 so in the coming weeks that's going to be one to watch it would be really really bad though if we did lose both of those because then we're going to about 78 dollars so a share which would be the 200 moving average and the amount of losses that would be from where we currently are to that is about a 36 percent drop in the market so just keep an eye because that head and shoulders if that is what it is there's a good chance that we could bleed significantly from that but again time will tell let's finish off with crypto uh where should we start should we do bitcoin should we do all yeah we'll start with bitcoin sounds let's good start with pull bitcoin. It on coinbase speaking of which coinbase i think now there's some type of partnership too i saw that this morning with uh the u.s marshals so the u.s government just using coinbase whenever they want and the sec is just uh yeah. suing them whenever they want. I don't know what's going on, guys. <laughs> yeah, the U.S. Marshal Services is using Coinbase to custody crypto that they have, which is so funny. Nice. Just really top-notch stuff. What a world. But Bitcoin right now, we're looking at it on Coinbase. Uh, obviously, different volumes and would be on, on uh, Binance. But I just wanted to show this because 15 to 200 moving averages are right here. We're starting to see this stochastic RSI just rally significantly fast to the upside. We got a major level of resistance right here, that 50 moving average. So I think 65K is going to be the next level for Bitcoin if we continue to see this rally going up. I do think you're going to find significant resistance at that level. Um, and again, I do think that right now we're seeing a lot of retail kind of pile in. Bitcoin pulled back from the 74, 75K level. People are really excited. Getting back in at around 60, maybe even some at 58, where it did dip down there. 
I don't know how long this lasts, but I do think that there's a good chance that we do see 50, I mean, 65,000 at the 50 moving average. And then we kind of just trade in between that range of 65 and 58. But the second you lose 58, I think all bets are off and we're going to be in a bit of a fire sale for crypto. And that's probably going to lead to, you know, Bitcoin leaves finding some support, maybe around 52, 53,000. And again, uh, it might be bounces along the way. So these on the way up, you might find your most of your support is where you kind of did this consolidation and shot up from that. I think it's going to be a very similar pattern on the downside. I do think that we're in a double top from this March high as well as this May high. It's a it's a rollover. And I think this is probably going to be your, off your best bet. So if we lose this and we lose a 200, then you're probably coming down to about 51, 52, 53, that range right there. Maybe you get a bit of a bounce, but I think from there, if this doesn't hold on the way down again, then you're coming down somewhere, you know, between 49 and 43. So look to the left to see what might happen on the right. That's kind of the strategy I'm kind of playing out here with technical analysis. And again, it's a very different market than where we were back in 2023 when we did have some pullbacks. It's also a very different market now that we're not seeing as many stable coins uh, being minted and pushed into the market. It just seems like the demand for crypto has died down since ETFs. Maybe if the ETH ETF goes live tomorrow or Wednesday, then we have some bullish momentum in the crypto market. But for Bitcoin right now, I think 65K is the target to watch. If it goes above that, then maybe we'll reassess. But I think that's important here. Let's now, go to ETH since you yeah. brought that up because – the anticipation has been that the ETF will be approved before the July 4th holiday. And I thought it would too. We only got a couple days left for that to happen. What is going to, you know, what will go on if they're like, you know what, we need to send these back. We need revisions to them. It's not happening. Like could be a buy the dip situation. I'm not as bearish as you are right now. I think that there are some positive catalysts potentially for crypto in the months ahead but what are we seeing in the eth chart here you know we're we're on a little bit of a bounce i'm looking at it like on my end i have the weekly pulled up uh we're fairly we're in this middle of kind of you know not oversold not overbought just kind of waiting to see where things go next but we saw it bounce back to 3500 for a hot second earlier to come back down a little bit we're trading in this range that has been you know if we look at this thing on the daily, it's been since, you know, late May that we've kind of been trading in this range. Where are we going next? Yeah. And is it all, is it all based on whether or not the ETF gets approved and the date that it goes live? I think it kind of is at this point. I agree. So if it doesn't go live and we get the jobs data first and the jobs data doesn't come back extremely strong, I would anticipate crypto to be a bit of a sell-off, right? I think it would make sense that we find a 50 moving average to be resistance. And we'd probably come down to maybe 32 again. If it's really bad, obviously the 200 moving average. Maybe down here is where we get the ETF and it bounces and then people kind of, you know, make a little bit of a trade there. If it goes live sooner than later, then maybe there's a good chance that we could see a bit of a breakout. Um, I don't know if you're going to be able to take out 39.7 though. Do you know what I mean? Like it being this high. I think that'd be extreme hopium at that point. I also think that a lot of the money that flowed into the Bitcoin ETFs, um, you know, flowed into the Bitcoin ETFs. I don't know if there's a lot of retail money that could flow into all these ETFs as soon as they go live. I'm sure there is, but for it to be a sustainable price that kind of, you know, is able to push up really high, who knows? We do know that a lot of insiders across the equity board are just taking profit as much as they can. Uh, they're not buying back their own shares on their on a personal level and personal accounts. So that kind of tells me that there's some problems there. I'm just following the money when I look at this, but I would think that there would be a good chance that we could see maybe 36, somewhere around here where we find some resistance, probably 37, 14, maybe find some resistance. I don't know if we put in a uh, higher high than what we did in May. I think maybe a lower high is more, uh, more I guess, uh, logical. But I do think that if we don't get that ETF approval before Friday, then we're probably going to be hovering somewhere between 32, 39, and where we currently are, just under the 50 moving average. Worst case scenario, obviously, is the 200 moving average at 3084. So that's just something to keep an eye on. But the thing I do want to wrap up with is all uh, total three, because I texted you guys over the weekend and I was like, "This thing looks like it's ready to fucking die." I think that was the literal quote that I I used. It was, and, exactly. and it's funny because we did get a bit of a bounce. As soon as I said that, I was like, ah, you know, right when it looks its worst, that's when you get these little uh, liquidation pumps. But 
at the end, at the same time, you're just holding on to that 200 moving average right here on the daily. Volumes are dropping as the price is pushing up, and it, it, this is the weakest price push up in my opinion. But you're also at 92.50, 92.56 on the stochastic RSA on the daily. I think there's a good chance that if we don't see this move to the upside at 50, the 50 moving average at 63 billion, 633 billion, my bad, then you're probably going to lose this 200. And the problem for the 200 is that your levels of support are somewhere between 558 billion and 534 billion. So if we look at this right now from where we currently are, let's say somewhere around here, about seven and a half, almost 8% drop to, you know, about a 12% drop in the market. So just think 12% off of some of your coins that you like, uh, you know, 10% at least at that point, if that's what does happen. So I do think that this is going to break, but the problem is if it does break below the 200 moving average, now the 200 moving average is resistance. So you're going to have to fight even harder to get it above it. 50 is going to be coming down for a death cross shortly afterwards. So, Alts to me still do not seem bullish. You get these little pumps here and there. If you're able to scalp those trades, amazing, wonderful. I just think long term, and if we're looking at this over the next six months or so, this chart is telling me future bearish as opposed to bullish. I think we kind of had that confirmation from this major uh, bear flag that was going up in this channel. And it just broke out of it, and you broke below the 200 moving average. So everything right now seems between these two moving averages um something bad comes out then obviously you're below the 200 and that's where all the money's going to be made for a lot of people who are short the market but until then we're just waiting to skip that moment it's going to be a boring week i think retail is pretty much the only one that's playing in the market at this time i assume all right that is going to wrap it up for today appreciate those who joined us we'll be back on wednesday to recap the latest jobs data and everything else that has been impacting the markets ahead of the July 4th holiday. Maybe we'll have some ETF news. Who knows? <laughs> if you have not yet, do us a favor, like, subscribe, drop a comment, share us out on social if you're so inclined. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Have an awesome week. If you're in Canada, happy Canada Day, and we will see you guys next time. Take care, everyone.